<coughs> well, uh, welcome uh, everybody uh, to this um, to this really interesting and good uh, panel uh, event. Um, uh, the, just to remind you, the title: Saudi Arabia's reforms countering extremism in a changing uh, kingdom. And this is going to take the form of a discussion on how Saudi Arabia's social reforms, uh, which you're all uh, reading about and hearing about, uh, will impact the kingdom and its continued collaboration and cooperation with the United Kingdom on countering uh, violent um, extremism. We're going to take the form of a conversation uh, between Her Excellency Dr. Hoda El Halaisi, as a member of Ashura Council of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Charlotte Leslie, who for the moment is invisible, uh, but you know, suddenly we can make things appear. <coughs> uh, Director of the Conservative Middle East uh, Council, and Charlotte will be here uh, any minute. Uh, now my intelligence uh, tells me. Uh, now, just briefly, um, just be clear about the aim of, um, of this event. Uh, it's to discuss and consider the impact of Vision uh, 2030 and the social reform program uh, on, of course, uh, you know, the, the kingdom um, itself, um, on uh, you know, British uh, uh, interests and policy in the, the region, of course, on um, extremism and the aims and objectives of counter-extremism, uh, to consider the realities of this task, um, and, as I've said, the policy implications for the United Kingdom, but also for you know, the major uh, Western uh, powers. This is something clearly, I mean, personally, I feel you know, quite, well, quite intensely involved with um, violent extremism, understanding it, and of course you can't counter it if you don't begin to understand it. Um, and, you know, personally, but also uh, my service and my colleagues have had a long experience um, in, in this area and a long experience of collaboration and cooperation, um, both on countering, um, well, first of all, of course, on countering terrorism um, <coughs> with the Kingdom of um, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia um, uh, as a close um, ally, and I hardly need to say that last year we had you know, a very stressful time with terrorist attacks um, in London. We might talk about that a bit uh, later. So understanding the complexity of this issue uh, and, uh, and understanding that terrorism and the, the best means of countering it is intimately tied up with other issues, goes beyond straightforward you know, secret intelligence work and it's into the very complex area of extremism and understanding it and therefore countering it. Uh, and, and of course, as you know, within the United Kingdom, over many years, we have sought to develop ways of doing this, and probably we do, and we have more developed programs in this area than almost any other country of, you know, of, uh, of our sort of uh, nature and, uh, and societal uh, characteristics. Now I'm thinking particularly of the Channel Program, uh, this is quite controversial, and it has its critics, uh, but it also has its achievements, and we might well want to talk about uh, that. And then the last uh, few months, the establishment by the government of the Commission on Extremism, uh, a non-statutory um, um, expert committee working within the realm of the, of the Foreign Office. Also, I'm bound to say that here at RUSI, this is a whole area of violent extremism, encountering it, that there's been a great deal of work done in the area of research, in the area of policy analysis, uh, program implementation, training and education. A range of projects worldwide which are underway um, uh, with RUSI involvement in some way or another. Now, in the discussion, before I introduce uh, our, uh, our main guest, uh, I'll repeat the point about the RUSI rules, that the presentations formally are on the record, but the question and answer and discussion are off the record. And, you know, I don't want to be scary, but I can be if necessary. And, and you know, please, that must be respected, that rule. And, uh, you know, our experience is that our discipline is good and it is respected, but I'll be watching. <coughs> um, now, I think um, that's enough to put the context in place. 
Um, and um, I will go ahead anyway, even though Charlotte isn't here, because you know, this is an opportunity to introduce Her Excellency Dr. Huda al Halesi, a distinguished Saudi academic, a senior political leader in Saudi Arabia, a member, as I've said, of the Shura Council, uh, advisory and oversight body appointed by His Majesty the King, uh, and uh, Her Excellency has been Vice Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the uh, Shura. A former Vice Chairperson at King Saud University, and you know, a range of public statements and, uh, uh, and you know, connection with the media. In fact, I think I saw you on the television last night. Yep. Yeah. Sky News, was Don't it? Yeah. No, it was fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in September uh, 2017, uh, you, um, uh, Her Excellency, spoke at uh, uh, United Nations Women's uh, on at the United Nations on women's rights in the Arab region between myth and reality. It's a really good title, actually, um, and that, that shows that you know an understanding straight away in that title of the complexity of what we're talking about. So if we can now, and if I can turn to Dr. Hoda, and please go ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much for, uh, am I on? Yes? Yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for this amazing introduction. I'm, I'm beginning to feel it wasn't about me, <laughs> about right. somebody else. Right. Doctor, I'm not a doctor. So please feel free just to call me Hoda. I'm more than happy to do that. I would like, if I may, just give a background before the discussion on anything else so that I can put the setting of where we are at in Saudi Arabia today, if that's okay with you. Of course. Okay. Please forgive me also, I will be reading. I was asked to do this very short notice and there's so much information I just want to, so I hope I don't bore you too much, but we can discuss any of the issues that will come up later. So when Vision 2030 was unveiled in April of 2016, Prince Mohammed bin Salman said, we have all the means to achieve our dreams and ambitions. There are no excuses for us to stand still or move backwards. I must begin by stating that the modern state of Saudi Arabia is young, barely 80 years old. Although if we are to be precise, we really should begin to count its age after the first revenues of petrol were received because that was when the infrastructure of Saudi Arabia began. And that was when this vast desert was transformed into, a big into the big contemporary cities that we know today. It is a country that is growing fast and, it which, and which has achieved immeasurable goals in its short, modern existence. It has immensely changed, not at the demand of external forces which view these changes as being slow and insufficient, but as part of the natural internal process of evolution. Socially, the country's makeup has evolved and we have seen improvements on all levels of human development from literacy to life expectancy and infant mortality to name but a few. In addition, we are gradually moving away from a tribal society with all its implications and traditions to one where the family nucleus and individuality are becoming more dominant. Throughout the years, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has gone through a development of modernization unlike any in the world and at a speed few countries have seen before. Now, this development is a continuous process and will continue to touch the lives of each and every citizen. It has witnessed incredible changes in the span of a single generation. Now, with a population made up of around 70% under the age of 30, it would be unreasonable to expect the country to remain stagnant, especially as we are dealing with a generation that is very well connected to the outside world through social media, education, travel. It is a generation that knows what it wants and where it wants to go. It is a generation that is directly and indirectly putting pressure on the government because its expectations are high and are continuing to rise, placing greater responsibilities on the shoulders of governance. The result is a program of restructurization and re-examination at all levels of government based on effectiveness, transparency, and more especially accountability. A program that is betting on this younger generation who wants to change and who will help in the transition towards it. We are undoubtedly at an important threshold in our development, and it is dictated by two factors, youth and the economy. Now, the third crucial element in the equation is education. 
which is fueling this development at a significant pace. If change is to remain and evolve, it can never be imposed on a country. It must come from within at the speed of its population. And we certainly are no exception. Starting with education, Saudi Arabia understands that the foundation stone of any industrialized society is education. And in 2005, the King Abdullah Scholarship Program opened the doors to education abroad for both girls and boys to receive bachelor's, master's or PhD degrees from some of the best universities in the world. There are over 150,000 students abroad today, all of whom will bring back to Saudi Arabia something that will have an impact to the country in the years to come. And in comes Prince Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030, a welcome roadmap which aims to transform Saudi economy in an era of low oil prices and overhaul most aspects of life in the kingdom. Prince Mohammed is the face of Saudi youth, speaking their language and understanding their dreams. And for him, as for our youth, religion does play an important role in his life, with the additional fact that he, like our youth, is more open to the outside world and more accepting of other cultures. And this is reflected in the title of his vision, which contains the Western rather than Hijri date, which is officially used in Saudi Arabia. So we say Vision 2030. The intention of which is to make Saudi Arabia the heart of the Arab and Islamic worlds, the investment powerhouse and the hub connecting three continents. This quote, is the door that has opened Saudi Arabia to the modern world, diminishing its dependency and reliance on oil, brought about a wide range of reforms and a real desire to return the country to a more moderate Islam. It is important to state that all political reforms bring with them social changes and social transformation. It is just as important as economic transformation. The 2030 reforms have stepped into cultural areas that have long been left dormant. And Prince Mohammed has said more than once that without establishing a new social contact between citizen and state, economic rehabilitation would fail. Today, people talk of investing in cultural events and entertainment facilities, of encouraging sports and finding a Saudi national identity by promoting ancient heritage without batting an eyelid. The specificity of Saudi Arabia is that any change, any reform, must come from within, like I said, but must be gradual and take into consideration people's notions of what is right if a negative outcome is to be avoided. By pushing social boundaries, the kingdom is being nudged towards change. At a time when there is a slump in oil prices, the necessity to diversify the economy and transform Saudi Aramco from an oil producing company into a global industrial conglomerate are, cru are crucial. Saudis are already paying a lot more for gas as well as for most consumer goods and services. A new 5% sales tax took effect on January the 1st of this year as part of an attempt to boost government revenues from sources other than oil. Socially, the changes that are, see are seen that we are seeing are based on the youth, on the economy and on women, and they indirectly go hand in hand. As I said, education is a priority and perhaps its most prominent aspect is that the government is aware of this and yearly allocates to a la the largest part of its budget. Sincere efforts are exerted not only to eradicate illiteracy from the country, but also to transform the people and by extension the nation into a country that can compete globally on different levels. By investing in education, you improve human development and human resources, which consequently will boost the country forward by effectively utilizing them in the national economy. Cultural enlightenment was part of the agenda of the King Abdullah Scholarships uh, program. And like I said, these students will return to the kingdom, as have those before them, to become part of the fiber of Saudi society by looking for work. Unfortunately, like anywhere else in the world, unemployment today is high and has climbed to a 12.8% in the last year. It is a burning issue with the government, which is trying to find solutions to it by means of creating new jobs. At least 5 million Saudis are likely to enter the workforce in the next 10 years, and generating employment is a huge challenge. The vision aims to draw workers away from government jobs into the private sector. It goes without saying that with education of this kind, the makeup of Saudi Arabia has and will continue to change, and this includes the effect it has had on the role of women in our society. Now, when schools for girls opened in the kingdom in 1962, literacy rates for women stood at barely at 2%. Five decades later, literacy rates for women stand at 97%, and that is only because some older women are illiterate, whereas literacy among the younger generation has almost been completely eradicated. 
a country's true development, economic growth, and international success can only come about when it uses 100% of its human resources, male and female. So let's talk briefly about the Saudi female. Who is she? Engulfed in her black abaya and veil, she depicts the epitome of the unapproachable. Does she have a voice or indeed a face? What kind of life does she lead or more appropriately, <coughs> is she capable of leading with all the restrictions that seem to hinder her? Does she contribute to society or is her role confined to simply childbearing? Now this stereotype of the Saudi woman is far from the truth. It has come about as a result of uninformed, sensationalist writings that prefer to focus on the so-called out of the ordinary because her way of life on the surface is so at odds with that of the rest of the world. And so she's depicted as oppressed, subservient to and suffocated by men, uneducated, not allowed to work and inferior to her partner. It always surprises me that this is still the opinion of some journalists writing in the 21st century. The truth is, that the Saudi woman has revealed herself to the outside world as being a strong and ambitious individual, <coughs> influencing and participating positively in society. In many ways, stubborn, she understands that education is her key to success and will unlock the doors to her goals. Islam, unlike what many believe to be true, encourages education regardless of gender, making education both a right and a responsibility. It is not Islam that hinders progression of women, and we must stop thinking of Islam as being responsible for impeding her success on a national or international level. There exists a fine line between religion and tradition, and generally speaking, much of what is seen by the West as being backwards and oppressive to women is based on traditions. Household today, households today can no longer live comfortably on one salary, forcing more and more women out into the marketplace. A further 1.3 million Women are expected to enter the workforce by 2030. The aim is to create jobs and raise the participation of women from 22% to 30% by 2030. They account for about 80% of Uber and Karim's passengers. As a domino effect, the ban on women driving has been lifted, putting the money paid to drivers into their pockets, allowing them to participate more fully in the workforce, go to school, run errands, or visit family and friends, basically have a fuller integration in society. Segregation of the genders has decreased as more and more women work alongside men in mixed environments. To further facilitate mobility, <coughs> the Ministry of Transport in 2015 set a 10-year expansion plan of its public transportation services with a budget of $90 billion for the metro lines and bus routes in Riyadh and Jeddah. Empowering women in Saudi Arabia to fully participate in all economic sectors is crucial if we are to build a stronger economy, accomplish the goals of Vision 2030, achieve internationally agreed upon standards of development and sustainability, as well as improve the general quality of life for all members of society. Advancing gender equality and empowering women can only be realized through the coordinated efforts of the private and government sectors. And research has shown that higher success rates are the result of gender diversity which means that there needs to be more done to ensure the inclusion of women, tapping into their skills and talents, regardless of whether they are at the bottom of the scale or at the top. And for this to happen, we need to see more support from stakeholders and the government alike, and the active participation of all actors involved and at all levels. Promoting gender diversity and equality, whether in job opportunities or salaries, especially in the private sector, should be made a priority. So, Women empowerment benefits the country in many ways, but the main advantage is the development of society through their earnings, as well as support for themselves and their families. An additional, maybe little talked about, yet important aspect is the fact that it could lead to a dis decrease in domestic violence because uneducated women are more prone to violence than educated women. Now, to what extent can the government change directions to actively incorporate women in the workplace and the fiber of its economy? In the last few years, we have seen reforms take place and the creation of additional jobs, but perhaps the most strategically significant act regarding women took place in 2013 when King Abdullah changed the Saudi basic law of governance by stipulating that a minimum, a minimum of 20% of the Shura Council shall be made up of women, which is a percentage that competes with most countries. This means 30 women <coughs> members out of a total of 150. Now, this was followed by the municipal elections and more recently the appointment of three women in leadership positions in the once all-male economic sector. Financially, Saudi Arabia also 
uh, have a Saudi women that have more than 45 billion Saudi rials in Saudi banks, 130 billion Saudi rials in real estate, and are involved in charitable organizations and humanitarian causes. Yes, we are moving and in the right direction. Now, this doesn't mean that the picture is all rosy or that challenges and obstacles don't exist. They do, and we are aware of them. Our true resources lie in the young generations, and even though they will have to deal with bigger employment problems than the ones my generation was faced with, they will lead the country towards a new modern state where the economy has pushed out of necessity more women into the workforce and into leadership positions. I believe that there will be a new status quo and that there will be more social acceptance of what primarily is a woman's right. Now, elsewhere in society, we see that sports will play more of a role in women's lives, and although many women often head to the gym to exercise, introducing sports for girls at school last year was a crucial move to their well-being. Now, this year has also seen them in stadiums to watch matches. Young people want entertainment. They don't necessarily want to travel to Bahrain or Dubai to find it. They want to be able to spend their money inside the kingdom. Cinemas will return to the kingdom after a 35-year absence. The movie industry in Saudi Arabia could be worth $1 billion. Concerts, too, are part of the new entertainment strategy. For instance, we've had the uh, American R&B singer Nelly played, uh, uh, playing a sold-out concert in Riyadh. John Travolta also visited. Two Comic Con events took place. And Mohammed Abdu performed in Saudi Arabia for the first time since the 80s. The development of the tourism industry is important to the kingdom, as more and more Saudis will be looking to spend their leisure time and their money in the kingdom, as they will no longer be able to afford the expenses abroad. Additionally, in a bid to attract foreign investment, all efforts are being made to facilitate the issuance of the first visa for tourism, for people to come visit the kingdom, its cities, its beaches, coasts and resorts, its traditional old villages that still live in the past, but also focus on the important archaeological sites that are peppered around the country. Eventually, they will come to visit the $500 billion futuristic city named Neom, which will be a hub of technological innovation funded by the Kingdom's Sovereign Fund and which will focus on industries including energy and water, biotechnology, food, advanced manufacturing and entertainment, and will power itself solely with wind power and solar energy. Now, these are but a few of the changes we are living in Saudi Arabia today. And although the early reforms that have been adopted so far have been promising, there is always a possibility that there may be challenges ahead in the implementation of the vision, especially as the cost of living increases. However, the future should look auspicious for international companies looking to enter the market, and many opportunities lie in healthcare, construction, and transportation for investors. We have already come a long way from the stereotypical desert living tribes that peppered the region during the early to mid 20th century before the high rises, the large streets and highways that have become synonymous to modernization and a default to globalization. Keeping our doors open and helping each other develop does not go against cultural value systems and traditions. On the contrary, they build bridges and Vision 2030 is the engine that will build these bridges to bring us closer to the transformation we seek. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Your Excellency, thank you uh, very much. That sets the scene uh, <coughs> very clearly. Uh, and um, I think I, I won't immediately ask uh, questions because we'll have that as a separate um, question and answer session. Uh, but if I can um, move straight away uh, to um, Charlotte uh, Leslie uh, to make any additional comments that she wishes to make, if I can just um, you know, briefly introduce. Uh, the director of the Conservative Middle East uh, Council. Uh, this um, exists uh, to you know, uh, allow for MPs and policymakers to gain first-hand understanding um, of the region through delegations, visits, publications, uh, uh, debates, and, and, and so on. From 2010 until June uh, last year, uh, uh, Charlotte Leslie was the MP for Bristol Northwest specialized in education, health, and the Middle East, and was chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Saudi Arabia. Very well qualified to be here. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me just extend my, my humble apology for slinking in so late. Um, I was lucky enough to be at a meeting with His Royal Highness the Crown Prince this morning, and it's testament to his energy and the kind of changes he's making that he was exceptionally generous with his time. Um, and I will say no more than that. So thank you for being so accommodating in my late arrival. Um, 
I'm surrounded here by experts, Your Excellency. You're such an expert, I'm not going to begin to try and compete with the insights you've just provided, but just to offer a couple of observations. The pace of change that the Kingdom is undergoing is, is palpable to all of us. Um, I don't think many of us or any of us will have seen a Kingdom or a country undergoing such change so quickly. One of the things that struck me about the man leading this change is that he fundamentally understands something that the English poet T.S. Eliot put so well when he warned against the folly of trying to devise, quote, systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Something that the Crown Prince seems to understand in his bones is that if you're to change a kingdom, you can't just rely on systems, however good those systems might be. The change comes from its people. One of the waves carrying this change forward is the oft-cited uh, statistic that 70% of Saudi Arabia is under 30. And that is a tide of change and a tide of energy which is perhaps making these changes possible. But any change when it's fast, however much many opportunities it presents, also carries with it commensurate risks. And we're here on International Women's Day, and perhaps counterintuitively, as well as talking about women's role in this change, I also want to cast our minds as well very briefly to men. Because when something changes for women, there'll be a lot of chaps who suddenly find their world has changed as well. If we look at happy societies, happy communities, whether that's as a local MP or globally and internationally, three things stand out as prerequisites for a healthy, happy society. And that's a population with a strong sense of three things. A sense of identity, who am I? A sense of purpose, what am I for? And a sense of community, who am I with? Who am I? What am I for? Who am I with? And for any change to be executed effectively, that sense of identity has to be at least maintained or perhaps built. Now, I, I can completely agree with Your Excellency when you say that the Saudi woman is not the woman as is portrayed, meek and mild, underneath her black abaya. I've had the privilege of meeting some exceptional women, and as a woman, I feel extremely intimidated by their intellect, independence, um, and general talent all round. For a man, this has got to be particularly intimidating. Um, and one of the challenges I think that the reformers face in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for Vision 2030 is that whilst the Crown Prince, from my observations, provides an extraordinary role model for youth, is a figure that many youth in the country see represents their point of view um, as, a as a young under 40s person in an ever-changing world. That role model is a national role model. For communities and societies to be healthy and flourishing, young people need not only a national role model to carry forward the vision of their country, but also local role models as well. And that's where I'm going to turn briefly to some observations I've made from domestic policy here in the UK, and I wondered whether perhaps there might be scope for us to engage in those areas with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In terms of state interaction, moving down to a local level, there is one key po point of contact in the UK where that happens, and that is education. One of the observations that's been pointed out to me in my conversations with people in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is that education is an area on which there may be a lot of work to do. Interestingly, I don't think I'm betraying a confidence when I say that the Crown Prince emphasised education in his meeting with a group of MPs this morning several times and very insistently. A couple of lessons that we've learned from education in the UK um, that draws some international evidence is, going back to T.S. Eliot's quote, system so perfect that nobody needs to be good, education is no different. We know our education systems across the world are only as good as the teachers who are in them. And one of the major challenges across the Middle East, but particularly, I think, in Saudi Arabia, is ensuring that teaching is not something you go into if you can't do anything else. Teaching is something you go into when you've reached the very top and pinnacle of what you can attain. Now, there are two organizations which I would suggest may be of interest to anyone looking at how this might be done in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The first is an organization called Teach First, which set up uh, initially in London spotted the problem that teaching was something that people tended to go into if they couldn't get into the city and couldn't get a higher paid job as a lawyer or something else. Not as an MP, that's not such a highly paid job. 
um, and set up a graduate program, making teaching one of the most high profile and high prestige professions to go into, taking the talents and skills that you learn from teaching to make it transferable into the city. That's been a tremendous success and has now rolled out over the country and its key thing has been it's changed the perception of teaching amongst the very top graduates in our very top universities to be something that our highest level of graduate would aspire to do. And, and that is gradually changing the nature of schools through changing the nature of people who go into those schools. The second interesting move which might be of benefit to look at is the setting up of a professional body for teaching in the UK. And I'm going to plug this because I was mildly involved in the setting up of it when I was an MP. It's called the Chartered College of Teaching. And it provides a professional identity for teaching in a way that other professions such as medicine, accounting, law have had. The effect of that is it means that it's a profession that people who want to develop themselves, develop specialist knowledge areas, go into, as opposed to the idea that there might just be behaviour management uh, um, policemen in difficult classrooms. Those two things have proved to be very powerful in, in, in improving the quality of teacher in UK classrooms. And although it's very dangerous to apply one met met remedy from one area of the world to a completely different area of the world, there may be lessons there that can be learned and knowledge that we can share. The second element that I've noticed essential, and I'll turn particularly now to the challenge faced by men in an era of ever more empowered women, is a sense of community identity and purpose and pride that can often be brought out through sport. I am a huge fan of the This Girl Can campaign that was run in the UK to get more women doing sport. And I was incredibly heartened to see uh, Saudi women running for change. I think it was uh, at a running race or a marathon last, last Sunday, um, this week. And, and to see that, that physical demonstration of how much the kingdom is changing. The more we look at neuroscience, the more we look at the relationship between our bodies and our minds, the more evidence is pointing to things that intuitively we know through common sense, that sport and physical activity changes things like self-esteem, is one of the most powerful tools for individuals in mental health, sense of confidence, sense of pride. What we're learning is that for women, in particular women who've suffered abuse or have lack of confidence for any particular reason, Sport gives an ownership of body and a confidence that is unrivaled in any other intervention that we found so far. Um, for men, we find that for men who may be struggling with a lack of pride, lack of immediate role models, sports and sports clubs provide avenues for developing a sense of identity um, in, an, in a male arena where they feel comfortable, which again, is very hard to recreate in any other environment. Something that, that Sir John didn't mention was when I was an MP, I was also, as well as being uh, privileged to be chair of the all-party group for Saudi Arabia, I was also chair of the all-party group for boxing. <laughs> you may laugh, but boxing in particular has extraordinary potential, which we're only just beginning to tap into in the UK, for diverting angry young men away from gangs and extremism into a better way of life. It provides exactly the things that gangs and extremists provide in the sense of male role models, an exciting masculine environment, uh, a sense of community in the club, uh, a sense of identity of being a boxer, and a sense, of sense, a sense of purpose and improvement. We look at sport as often, sometimes as an optional extra. We look at education as the lifeblood of our future. I would suggest perhaps that one of the ways in which the UK can very fruitfully interact with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is to support what the Kingdom is already doing um, in those two fields and to bolster up what the Crown Prince intuitively knows, that whilst systems, you may, may have to avoid systems so perfect that nobody needs to be good, what we should be aspiring for is systems so perfect that they enable people to be good. And perhaps the UK can contribute in some small way to that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Charlotte, for that. And uh, <coughs> now what I uh, would like to do is to move into the, um, into the question and answer uh, discussion. Uh, so the rules, as I said, um, as we both said, Michael and I, <coughs> apply from, uh, from now on. <laughs>